It's the e-commerce master plan podcast here to help you solve your marketing problems and grow your e-commerce business. Cutting through the hype to bring you inspiration and advice from the e-commerce sector and beyond. Here's your host, Chloe Thomas. Hello and welcome. It's marvellous to have you tuning in. Now, if you've been listening for a while, then you'll know that since December, I've been on a mission to inspire you to take uh, the path to net zero. So to make your business more climate friendly, to embrace sustainability, to do, to use all our skills to make this world a better place, I suppose. And if you haven't been here since December, it's very cool to have you tuning in. Welcome to the show. This is, I think, the most inspiring interview yet in our world of interviewing successful e-commerce businesses that are also doing amazing things for the people, for people and the planet and so forth. Hugely inspiring guest who is, if you're already set up and running as a business, she's going to inspire you how to make your business better. And if you are looking for a way to create a sustainable business, something in the circular economy, a brand that does better, then um, I think you are going to get an awful lot out of this one too. She explains it all so much better than I ever could. So I'm going to shut up now. We're going to listen to the sponsors and then we will welcome today's guest. Getting an online business off the ground is not easy. So if you find yourself working late, tackling a to-do list that's a mile long with your fifth cup of coffee by your side, remember, great email doesn't have to be complicated. That's what Clavio is for. It's the email and SMS platform built to help e-commerce brands earn more money by creating genuine customer relationships. Once you set up a free Clavio account, you can start sending beautiful branded messages in minutes, thanks to drag and drop design templates and built-in guidance. And with e-commerce specific recommendations and insights, you can keep growing your business as you go. Get started with a free account at clavio.com forward slash masterplan. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash masterplan. And now to introduce today's special guest. Cressy Wessling, CBE, is the co-founder at Elvis and Cressy, the designers, manufacturers and sellers of their own range of sustainable and ethically produced luxury accessories and homewares. Founded in 2005, they now sell via Shopify. They donate 50% of their profits to charity and last year donated over £100,000 and saved over 14 tonnes of materials from landfill. Hello, Cressy. Hi. Great to have you here. Um, How did you get into e-commerce? We got into e-commerce very quickly after starting the business. And the reason that happened was twofold. One, we started making belts out of decommissioned fire hose, and we didn't think anyone was going to sell these on our behalf. (laughs) Um, two, we hated, oh, there's three reasons actually. The second one was that we didn't like the standard way of selling, you know, going to fairs. Um, we went to a few things like that and we found them really, really depressing. And three, there was a way to get online. You know, we could code a website with Dreamweaver. We could put these buy now buttons on it. People were starting to think about using the internet to buy things. And we thought, yeah, this could be quite a good way to test the water. I think in the beginning, we thought it was going to, that it was a good experiment to see if people would buy our pieces online. And the fact that people did meant that we could just continue to reinvest. And that's now, I think 80% of our business comes through our own website, elvisandcressy.com. So it was very much business idea first, e-commerce became the most obvious route to market. So what led you to come up with the business idea? Because you, you kind of tantalized the audience there with reusing fire hoses. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> t- there must be an interesting story here. Please, please let us know why the business started. So I, I moved to the UK in 2004 and I am, I'm, a, I'm a tourist, but I suppose I'm not your average tourist. The first thing I did was um, book myself onto a tour of the Victorian sewers under London because I'd heard how spectacularly amazing they were and I was not disappointed. Um, And then on the second day, I went to a waste transfer station in Battersea, uh, which doesn't exist there anymore because it's all very flash housing. Um, And on the third day, because at the time you couldn't Google ONS data on waste statistics and find out 
just how wasteful a society this was. I went to the British Library, to the Business and IP Center, and found an incredibly friendly librarian who helped me track down those statistics. So, so there I was day three, and I found this report that said the UK had sent 100 million tons of material to landfill in that year. And I didn't have any reference point for 100 million tons. I couldn't get to grips with it at all. So I decided to then start visiting all of the landfill sites that I could get to. And I saw a fire hose at one of these landfill sites. I mean, essentially, I was looking for something to do. I had a previous business, which I'd, I'd moved on from. Um, and I was really excited about solving a problem. So I was never, I was never going to sit in a room and think of a business idea. I was going to be out on the streets, in the dumps, in the depths of despair, looking for an opportunity. And certainly... That was something that was very possible at landfill sites in 2004. And it's still possible if you went to a landfill site today in 2022, because although we've reduced our waste to landfill to about 30 to 40 million tons, 30 to 40 million tons is still an inexcusable amount of material. And still an amount of a material it is impossible to imagine, yes. I think. Yes. And um, I am now very, very much wanting to do the tour of the sewers. As a fan of Basil Jet myself, I am thinking I need. I didn't know you could. So, uh, so that that's me distracted for the rest of this interview. Hopefully, not the listeners do. <laughs> um, so, so you basically, luckily, you were at a landfill when there was some fire hose. Yes, I saw, I saw one fire hose, and I thought that was quite curious. And at the same time, I had signed up for a course on ISO fourteen thousand and one environmental auditing, which sounds as dry and hideously boring as it is. But I was looking to have a way of understanding how to set a baseline for where you might be with your environmental processes and how you could improve from there. So although it was boring, I was in that in that course. And there was two guys from London Fire Brigade in the same course. And I said, hey, I've seen this hose in landfill. Like, what was it doing there? And they said, oh, hose is a big problem for us. And I was like, no way, you know, anyway, I then went to see it. I went to Croydon, which is where the vast majority of hoses in the UK go to die, essentially. They go there to be assessed, repaired if possible, and decommissioned if not. And although fire hose is only a three to 10 ton a year problem, so it's not, it's not as extreme as 100 million tons, I thought at the time, I was 26 years old and newly arrived, didn't have a network here. I thought, wow, I can fix this. This can be how I come to the UK. This can be how I start to form, form a community. This I can fix this one thing. And I thought I'd be able to do it really quickly. And then I can pick the next problem and solve that and pick the next problem and solve that. So you spotted this, this opportunity with this waste product that was the fire hoses. What led you to decide to turn that into, into handbags? Because I, I, one of the reasons I'm asking this is because I think um, you say it was only a small part of it that you've you've affected the you know, small part of that overall waste. But I think because of the product you, you've then created out of it, you are also changing people's perceptions of what is waste and inspiring other people, the cu customers to buy more products made from waste products. And potentially you've inspired other people over the years to go and find another piece of waste and do it. So the, the impact becomes much larger than what you're doing yourself. So I'm, I'm intrigued as to how you went, let's go designer handbags. I mean, this this is actually what, what got really exciting then, because initially my first thought was, oh, it looks a little bit like terracotta. And because it's fire hose and it's clearly fireproof and waterproof, it's going to be great for making roof tiles. But I'm I'm nothing if not a hardcore researcher. So I started to, to think about what do I need to know about fire hose as a problem in order to solve it? How much is there? What are its properties? You know, where do I get it from? What what happens when you apply heat to it? What happens when you try and weld it? What you know? What happens? What happens? What happens? And I discovered that fire hose, if it's not a hose anymore and there's no water running through it, is not fireproof at all. It, it can ignite. You have to put it in an oven at 250 and then a blowtorch on it. But still, <laughs> <laughs> but it can. <laughs> it can. And if you leave it in the sun for about 10 to 15 years, it will crack. So as a roof, it would have been a disaster. And and I think. I've always been massively into research. So I was studying like, what is nitrile rubber? That's the material that makes hose. Who's using it? What are they using it for? And I 
discovered back, this is back at the British Library, that certain French luxury houses have been using nitrile rubber in their collections since basically the dawn of complex polymers. And I thought, this is bizarre because why 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 are they generating a brand new material when this material exists i don't understand this this gives you an idea of how little i understood luxury at the time i also thought let's look more into luxury itself and i found this incredible report that had been commissioned by the world wildlife fund which analyzed all of these luxury businesses basically the top luxury houses and it found that none of them scored above a c in terms of their environmental and ethical performance and for me you know, with my, uh, let's say, green tinted glasses that I wear, I thought, well, here's an industry that structurally failed. In the same way, I've always looked at fossil fuels as a failure, because if you have that much private profit at basically the, where, where, where the whole future of human civilization is put at risk, is the profit really justifiable? I would say no. I would say that's a structural failure and we should think again. And luxury is largely the same. And although we've made great strides in the last 10 to 15 years, you know, we've been doing this for 17 years, I still look at it as an industry that structurally failed because the pace at which it works, the processes it deploys, and largely the raw materials it works with are all extractive or in some degree exploitative, and they are not net regenerative businesses. So for me to, to take the hose and discover that it had luxury potential, and then think, ooh, on top of that, I can challenge this whole industry, gave me just quite a rush, I think. And it's a rush that I still, that still drives <laughs> me every day. Um, you know how people, you say, oh, I'm sitting on my high horse, sort of, you know, feeling very smug. Well, I don't feel smug at all, but I do feel like what we've done gives me the right to demand of other businesses what we expect and to deliver ourselves. So that platform element, so, so it was both, here's a way I could use this waste material, plus if I go into the luxury space, there's a big conversation to be had here and I can, I can not buy my way in, but I can put down the pathway to get myself into those conversations by creating the product. I can earn my way in. I can earn a right to sit at that table and because we're doing it, it we're actually doing I'm not, I'm not campaigning for things to change. I'm showing that things don't have to be the way that they are and that profit can be made, waste can be rescued, donations can be made, and everybody can be happy. And isn't that a, isn't, isn't that a good alternative to just selling expensive things that are relatively meaningless? I don't know. I think so. I would agree with you. And you've expanded it now from not just the fire hose waste product, haven't you? There's there's other sources of waste you've been able to tap into as well. Yes. So we started with fire hose, but I, I mean, if I think back to my early landfill days, I had a notebook where I just made lists and lists of lists of all the interesting materials that I saw coming in. Not all of them have luxury potential, but I'm kind of agnostic. If there's a waste that I think I can, a problem, that, a waste problem I think that Elvis and I can solve, I will put a reasonable amount of time into working out how we might do that. So for us, we now rescue failed parachute panels and coffee sacks and tea sacks and printing blankets and and leather offcuts. And leather has become a big thing for us. And we've worked for the last several years with Burberry in, an, in a very innovative partnership with their offcut leather. And for us, you know, there's the sky's the limit. People are always saying, what are you going to do when you run out of fire hose? And, and, and I just say, well, there's 30 million tons still going to landfill. So I don't think I'm going to be stressed out. I think I'm just going to be excited about the next opportunity. But yes, we do 15 different ways. And at, and at our new site, to take us right back to the beginning, we even treat our own sewage, which I have to say is my own. Um, it was like a it's just I feel like it's my biggest victory because it takes me right back to the beginning. Um, I, I think it's truly inspiring what what you what you guys have done over the last seventeen years, and I really hope that that sharing your story we can inspire some of the audience to um to follow in your footsteps, even if that is you know going and hanging out at the waste centres and going and seeing what's ending up in in the rubbish tips. For anyone who we'll get into kind of some other elements of the business in a minute, but for anyone who has gone. 
wow, I need to go and find some waste. I need to get into this circular economy thing. I need to go and become more regenerative. Have you got a couple of tips? Because presumably it's a, it would be a bit easier to do now um, to find these opportunities than it was 17 years ago. So any tips for them? Yes. And, and actually, I get this question almost on a weekly basis. And we know that the, the work that we've done has inspired, I think, something like it, at last count, 48 other businesses to have wow. started and flourished in all parts of the world. And, you know, the first thing I say is you've got to find a problem that's local to you. Uh, so the first thing that I urge people to do is not walk down the high street, but walk down the back streets or the back alleys and look in all the skips. Go to some local industrial estates and, and ask what kinds of wastes are consistently being produced. And you'll you'll find this unbelievable variety that's suddenly available to you. You know, we we make all of our own packaging from 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 waste, which means we don't have bills to <laughs> to buy packaging. It means we also didn't struggle when there was a big cardboard shortage because we were using waste as an input and we could always get more of that. So I think the interesting thing is to focus on a local problem. The other piece of advice I'd give is that the research is absolutely fundamental. You can't just see a material and go, oh my gosh, that's going to be great. I know what I can do with that. You have to know everything about it. You have to find out how much is available to you. Because, okay, yes, our fire hose would have failed as a roofing material just because of the flammability issue. But also, there isn't enough fire hose waste globally annually to have a successful roofing business. It's too niche. It's too small. It requires way too much work to clean it and transform it. So, so it would have been wildly inappropriate to go into an industry like that, whereas luxury means we we can price it according to labor. We can take the time to clean it effectively. We can um, spend the time required on it, embed the craftsmanship and design in it to make it truly wonderful and outstanding. So you have to first discover a problem local to you, and then you have to find out absolutely everything there is to know about it, because that informs the solution. The solution comes from really, really being married to the problem. That's awesome advice. Thank you very much. Um, you you mentioned, you know, I think one of the things which is really interesting is you say you're using recycled packaging, which I think I think all of us can see the opportunity. If I think about the amount of cardboard we seem to generate as a household in a in a month is just insane. But I know some people get a bit nervous about using recycle because they don't think it's going to look good enough for the brand. And on a business front, often people think collecting recycled packaging from other people is going to take too much time and require too much storage space to process it. So whilst it's not costing you it takes more time, which is my way of leading into. So what does your team look like? How many of you are there in the business managing the supply chain, the manufacturing, the marketing and, and so forth? How does that, does that look fundamentally different to how it would look in a normal e-commerce business? A hundred percent different. Normal e-commerce businesses that I encounter, especially if they're, let's say, UK-based SMEs, will have seven to 10 people working there they're all marketing and and customer service. Nobody's manufacturing. So you'll have somebody who's at the head of logistics and supply chain, and what they're doing is negotiating with manufacturers. You'll have somebody who's doing design, and, and they're probably involved in buying raw materials and making sure it gets to the manufacturing sites. And then everyone else is involved in selling and making sure the customers are happy. We have 25 people. There's only three of us that are involved in manufacturing. We make everything ourselves. So we are manufacturing heavy. We do not outsource anything. Everything is insourced. And yes, things take time. But the really interesting thing, and I know this is a big deal for e-commerce brands, particularly because so many of us, and I'm sure so many of the listeners will have had the same emails I've had from these companies that want to sell you debt they want to sponsor your growth. They want to pay for your stock so that you can expand faster. I don't pay for my raw materials. I don't pay for my packaging. And yes, does it cost? Is, is, is there more time involved? Yes. But time is slow and you do things as and when you need them. So you never have to buy enough material to make your product run of 20,000 pieces up front, one big hit and then pay the manufacturing bill for that in one big hit and then hope to goodness that you're able to sell that through 
And then that results in overstocking and not selling enough and, and, and having to, you know, get rid of unsold stock at lower prices. We never do discounts. We never do sales. We small batch produce when something runs out, we celebrate the fact that it's run out. We call it the joy of running out of stock. And then we make more. And if people have to wait, they have to wait. And we found that that people actually like waiting. They then in the interim like to commission bespoke pieces and do other kinds of things. So yes, we look fundamentally different, but there are some benefits to that. And having less cash flow pressure is one of them for sure. I think it the less shocking thing is that having low stock volumes and kind of the the FOMO, the urgency, the scarcity piece. I think it's a lot easier for people to grasp how that's a benefit than the than to really get their heads around. I'm sorry, you don't pay for stock. It's like you know, I can see, I can, th- I can almost hear the listeners of the future as as we record this, kind of going, "Is that possible? <laughs> Is it possible not to pay for materials?" But I suppose, but that's one of the, you know, when we're talking about sustainability and saving the planet and net zero and the circular economy you are using a waste product, which often costs, is a problem for the person who's throwing it away because they have to pay to have it removed. So it's one of, you know, reducing waste should also, I think most of the time, reduce cost as well. Yes. And it absolutely does. And and there are a lot of people who pay us to take the raw material in the first place, which, which you know, even if it's a small amount that just covers the shipping, what it shows you is that they are desperate <laughs> often to get rid of these things. Um, but yes, it is cheaper for sure. And I think what one of the things which I wanted to kind of, do, you know, make really clear to the audience, which they probably already got from the, from the way you've been talking about everything, is that ethics and sustainability is totally embedded in everything your business and you as people do. It's a lot more than just, we want to be sustainable, but it, it's, it seems, seems to be every single angle of the business. There's a sustainability and ethics right at the core of the decision making and what you do. Are there any other elements of that that people might find a bit, wow, you went that far or um, surprising about it all? Yes. there's. So I'm glad you brought up the term decision making because we started doing this almost a decade ago, but we make business decisions like anybody else. Oh, you know, are we going to move from I don't know, big commerce to Shopify or blah, blah, blah. We make business decisions like anyone else. But the last question we tend to ask ourselves is, is this going to make the world better for other people's grandchildren or not? And if the answer is not, then we don't do it. And if the answer is we don't know, then we investigate. So it is every single decision, every single decision. And it's because, I don't know, Al Gore did this round the world film promotion tour for an inconvenient truth about, I don't know, 10 years ago now. And at the time he said, we've got 10 years to save the planet and virtually nothing happened. Everything got worse. So we're out of time now. And I act with urgency in everything that we do. So when Greta says, why aren't you acting like your house is on fire? I am, you know, we're at our, at our new site, we're constructing a workshop out of straw bales because straw bales, are highly insulative, one, they're local, two, and the, they suck carbon out of the atmosphere while they're growing, and now they're locking it away for the rest of my building's life. Are, is it more expensive to construct in this way? Absolutely. But could I use another material? I don't think so. You know, The first thing we invested in here was a wetland-based sewage treatment system so that just through the action of plants, and we've planted, I think, 3,000 separate plants to do this, just through the, the, you know, the interaction between the, the root and the soil and, and the growth of the plant itself, we can treat all of our own wastewater and turn it into drinking quality, bathing quality water. Why isn't everyone doing this? I, d- I don't know. Why isn't that the first decision that any developer should make at a new site? I don't know. But if I don't do it, then what am I, say- what am I saying about the urgency of climate change and biodiversity loss? So I feel these things very keenly. And I think what's maybe interesting about Elvis and I as a, as a partnership is that he is very focused on how to tackle problems right now, today. And for me, I'm just trying to think about what is, what is our only possible way to interact with the planet in the future, if we have a hope as a civilization. And, and the, com- the combination of those two 
levels of focus, I think, means that we have both, you know, n- nearsightedness and farsightedness taken care of. <laughs> How do you manage to stay positive? This is, I, I ask because this is something I've been discussing with, with a couple of friends recently. It's with all the horrendous news and just the fact that the horrendous climate news seems to get pushed to the sub note of the news and isn't front and center. You know, I, I have those days where I'm like, oh my God, this is overwhelming. I don't know what to do. I don't know. And, and I feel like I'm almost on a daily basis batting off depression and miserable thoughts. So as somebody who's been doing this a lot longer than most of us, how do you manage to stay positive? I think hope comes from action. And a lot of people think it comes the other way around. So we're acting every day. Every day we are rescuing fire hose. Every day we are running a business in a good way. You know, we're a living wage employer. We create apprenticeships. We give money to charity. We, you know, as a matter of course, you know, 50% of the profits is a lot. It's a big commitment. And we've moved the business to a farm so that we can do regenerative agriculture. Like there isn't ever enough that we could do that would make up for the amazing lives that we've got. So Elvis and I both feel like we've got debts we can never repay and they're debts to humanity. And it's, it's because, Hey, I grew up in an amazing family in Western Canada at a time when, when really like girls could just do whatever they wanted and, 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 and achieve whatever they wanted and have a great free education and healthcare system and, support at every level of my career and and I and I know that not every not everyone in the world gets that so what am I going to do with that and that's why we have to act and how do we stay positive I mean yes of course the news can just drag you and it should drag you because that's what should then spur you on to act fiercer and be more bold and try and do things faster I have times when I rant at the radio and and certainly at specific politicians and business leaders like everyone else. And sometimes I need to, you know, have some red wine and some pizza. I mean, part of the reason we're on a farm and we're decided to plant vines and grow grapes is because, you know, wine is a, is a great way to sometimes get through those, those uh, Friday nights when you're a little bit annoyed, but the, the biggest thing is action. The, the, the only way to solve any problems like this is not to be sad but to do. E-commerce master plan is supported by some of the greatest companies in the e-commerce sector. Here's a reminder of who they are. The subscription market is predicted to grow to nearly $500 billion by 2025. Recharge is the leading subscription management solution helping e-commerce merchants of all sizes launch and scale their subscription offerings. Recharge powers the growth for over 15,000 subscription merchants, turning one-time transactions into long-term customer relationships. Whether you're a direct-to-consumer business or an omnichannel brand, subscriptions strengthen your brand's relationship with your customers and make it easy for consumers to make repeat purchases, bringing you predictable revenue, increased customer loyalty and higher average order values. Turn transactions into relationships and experience seamless subscription commerce with Recharge. You can get started today with the subscription payment solution trusted by over 50 million subscribers worldwide by heading over to rechargepayments.com forward slash masterplan. Ever wondered how your business is doing compared to other businesses in your sector? Are you on track or behind the pack? Well, now's the time to find out what's going on in your market. There's a fantastic new benchmark service for retail e-commerce businesses from the customer and marketing analytics experts, Sweet Analytics. Participants sign up online. It's free, only takes two minutes to set up and your data is secure and anonymous. Sweet online retail index results are available daily and a weekly summary email summarizes results and provides a full market view. You will always know where you sit against the pack. Sign up now with Sweet online retail index and find out if your business is on track. Sign up at benchmarks.sweetanalytics.com That's benchmarks with an S and sweet like sugar. So go to benchmarks.sweetanalytics.com now. It's time time for the top tips round. Okay, Cressy, thank you so much for for 
letting us explore your experience and sharing so many tips with the audience. We are now going into our top tips section, which gives us some really quick ideas for taking our businesses to the next level. So, um, Cressy, are you ready for the top tips? Yes. Okay. The book top tip. If everyone listening to this podcast agreed to take Friday off and read a book to make their business better, which book would you recommend? I would recommend two books. One, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, uh, which is just the best introduction into why we need to act on the environment fast, fast, fast. And it's an old book, but it's just brilliantly written. And the second one is Mid-Course Correction, which is the story of interface carpets and how really they started to put sustainability first and it made them a better, more resilient, more profitable company. So it depends what you're after. If you're after straight biology and science, go for um, Silent Spring. But if you're after a real story of a business that completely reinvented itself and mid-course correction is fantastic. Very nice. I The listeners often hear me say that needs to go on my wish list. Listeners, I am buying both of those the second we get off this recording. Well, actually, as soon as I've downloaded the files. Um, okay, the traffic top tip. Which marketing method do you either prize above all others or think doesn't get the press it deserves? The only marketing strategy that we use is is truth. In our industry, there is a huge lack of transparency. And people love to talk about the secret collection that they're about to drop or release. And they don't want to talk about how it was made and they don't want to talk about where it was made. Probably the reason why we have such a small marketing team is because we just tell the truth. And we find that the truth that we have to tell is compelling enough. We also do the same when people call us up, when they ask us questions online. If they say, why are these items so expensive? I'll say, because I'm not prepared to make a great ecological bag at the expense of of paying someone really, really poor wages in a country where there are weak labor laws in order to make that bag cheaply. I want to make sure that we work with highly skilled craftspeople that are that are paid well. So transparency and honesty and the truth are actually incredibly effective. As long as you're not doing something deceitful and horrible and nasty, they work really well. <laughs> it's step one, don't do anything horrible, deceitful and nasty. And then tell the truth. It's it's simple, but it works. Um, it's, it's good for the soul as well, I think, the first part. Um, the tool top tip, maybe a collaboration tool, a social media plugin, a phone app, or just a way of working. Is there a cool little tool you use that makes you and your team more efficient from day to day? There's a few. I think I like working, we work with a social media agency and we work with them on Slack. And I really like that because it's immediate and their whole team is open to replying. So you don't have to do this reply all and scan through big chains. You know, I, I find Slack works really well for that. But in terms of communicating with customers, I, I do I do love the immediacy of, of social media. I love how people can just pop a comment on and you can get back to them straight away. And you can do that on the train or while you're walking the dog and you don't have to be chained to a desk the whole time. I like how that's very portable now. And then the growth top tip. If you met someone today who's focused on growing their e-commerce business from 100 orders per month to 1,000, what would be your number one tip for them? Now, this is interesting because we had a time when, I mean, certainly we had that as a real focus because we we were e-commerce from day one, but there were years when the traction was really, really low. And the biggest thing was was actually finding new and innovative ways of driving people to the website. Now, I know that that's hard, slightly harder now because there's so many other websites to work with as competition. But we found that you know just telling our story to journalists and and really making our work compelling to other people meant that they wanted to drive traffic to the website. So let's say this is and this is a, a very very crucial example. What I had so many people in the early years say, gosh, 50% donation is a lot. It's extraordinary. I think it's too high, particularly people who are like wanted to invest in the business. We've never taken investment, but these, these investor tourist people, that was the big thing going, mm, you're going to have to shrink that. And what they were missing was the fact that in the UK alone, there are 66,000 fire service personnel. That's just the people in the fire service now. That doesn't include their friends, their family, the people who are retired and their friends and their family and people who've been saved by someone in the fire service and people who go on uniformdating.com because they have a thing for firemen. You know, it's it's a huge group. And because we are 
we do something really profound with the fire service community. We rescue their hose and we find a way to make sure the hose can rescue them right back. We've created a reason for 66,000 people plus, plus, plus to want to share our story in a completely an authentic, authentic way. Not because we've begged them to, not because we're offering them a discount to do so, because they feel that our story is their story, because it is their story. And that's really why we got the traffic that we got and why it started to sort of virally increase. Because as we then opened that up on social media to fire service communities around the world, it just took off. Could one be terribly cheesy and say, you've done a circular story as well as a circular product? Yes. It isn't. And I really, I think it's also really important in a time when we've got rising inequality and huge issues with, um, you know, we're going to have, we are going to have food shortages. We are going to have rising food, food costs and we are going to have rising energy costs. And it is really important for people to understand that our business is based not just on the circular flow of materials, but on the circular flow of capital. I'm not trying to build an empire. I'm not trying to build personal wealth. I'm trying to do something good that I can be proud of. And part of that means letting go of the money too, and making sure it flows back into the communities that need it way, way, way more than we do. Cressy, thank you so much. You've given us all an awful lot to think about. Before we say goodbye, could you please let the listeners know where they can find you and your business on the web and social media, please? You can find us at www.elvisandcressy.com and all of our social handles are Elvis A-N-D Cressy. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you and um, it's been an utter pleasure to be able to share your story with the audience. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks a lot. What an inspiring guest. I think if um, if Cressy hasn't given you ideas for finding a whole new set of product or materials sourcing, I suppose, I'd be surprised if she hasn't given those of you who are listening, looking for a business idea. Well, there was a whole host of them too. A couple of key phrases I took from that, asking yourself, is this going to make the world better for other people's grandchildren before making any decision? I find that quite inspiring. I am definitely not living up to it yet, but maybe that's an, a name for me for the rest of the year. And that hope comes from action, which is oh so true. You can get your hands on our notes from this this show, including the top tips, links to what we've mentioned and much more by heading over to ecommercemasterplan.com forward slash podcast, or you can use our new special director episode links. Just put ECMP, that stands for e-commerce master plan, ecmp.info forward slash episode number into the URL bar, and you'll go straight to the right episode page. So this episode would be ecmp.info forward slash 392. And yes, my lovely team have set this up for every single episode since 2015. Once you do get to the website, you can also add yourself to our email list so you don't miss out on any of the other things I share to help you improve your business. Thank you so much for tuning into this and every episode of the e-commerce master plan podcast. I bring you a new interview every single week because I want to inspire and help e-commerce business owners to succeed and thrive with their businesses, including progressing along the path to net zero. So if you know someone this show can help, please tell them to listen to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Now, in my outro, I usually give you another episode to go and have a listen to. But in this instance, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to tell you to listen to this one again, because Cressy is so inspiring. I think we should all listen to this one at least twice. I hope you have a great week and don't forget to keep optimizing. Thank you for listening to the e-commerce master plan podcast. Find out more at ecommercemasterplan.com slash podcast. If you're marketing an e-commerce brand, you already know that data changes everything. More data means more power. And if your email or SMS tools can't handle all that data, they're probably holding you back. That's where Klaviyo comes in. Its top-notch personalization and segmentation help you send the right message at the right time, guided by unlimited real-time data from your online store and tech stack. 
Request a demo at clavio.com forward slash master plan. That's K L A V I Y O dot com slash master plan.